we are looking at the growth of Protestantism. We're particularly going to be looking at uh, the ways in which immediately following the Reformation, we had the, the growth of Protestantism in various countries in Europe. Probably spend more time talking about Great Britain than anywhere else. Um, and about what, you know, we'll also talk about France and a few other places. Um, you're going to get some British history today. You need some, Laura? Okay. Um, and the simplest way to do this, I, I'm not doing this just because of a fascination with English um, royalty and all of that sort of thing, that sort of thing, although obviously everybody's focused on European royalty right now, well, the new prince and uh, whatnot. But I do need to talk about um, the period from the War of the Roses on, because these things really are very important for understanding what happened with the Reformation. Um, let me sort of lay this out for you. The War of the Roses, you may have heard of. It, it was a really bad movie with Kathleen Turner and, um, oh. and Michael Douglas, oh, but that's no. not what I'm talking about. <laughs> a horrible movie, a depressing movie. Don't ever watch it. The War of the Roses, actually, in England, um, in the 1300s, uh, Edward III became the King of England. Well, Edward III had like 13 children, five of whom were males who survived. They became the five great duchies, or dukedoms, you know, they had five dukes. All of them had some legitimate claim to the throne, and so as time passed, each of those became houses. Um, what's called, the, and in particular, two of them gained prominence. For a period of a number of generations, the House of Lancaster, the Duke of Lancaster, one of the, one of the sons of Edward III, his descendants, um, became the kings in England. They were uh, Henry the Fourth, Henry the Fifth, Henry the Sixth. Another house, which was very powerful, which was not on the throne at that time, but always wanted to be, was the House of York. You see these at the top: House of Lancaster, House of York. Now, I've not given you the whole genealogy because that's not our focus. But the War of the Roses was a period of time in which those two houses, the House of Lancaster and the House of York, fought. A whole series, in fact it wasn't really one war, it was like a series of different wars to try to gain control of the English throne. The House of Lancaster, Henry V, had been a, uh, a pretty powerful king. He was successful in uh, the Hundred Years' War against France. He had won the Battle of Agincourt, which was a major battle where they were ter terribly outnumbered, but, but he won anyway, and so he had a good reputation. When Henry V died, his son, Henry VI, became king. Henry VI was everything that his father wasn't in a negative way, meaning he was weak, he was ill, he actually suffered from mental illness, he had a number of bouts of mental illness that incapacitated him, um, and he had inherited that from his grandparents. His, you know, one of his grandparents had had mental illness. Henry the, the sixth, um, and these numbers here, one, two, three, four, five, six, that's the order in which these various people became, became the kings or queens. Um, and, and the ones that are in gold here, sort of yellow color, they're the kings, kings or queens, all right? They're the ones that actually achieved the throne. Well, when Henry the sixth, he married Margaret Beaufort, who herself had a claim to the, the, the throne, had a right to um, a, a legitimate claim. Everybody's always talking about how much of a claim they had. And it had to do with the right of ascendancy to the throne came through the oldest son and then the oldest son of the oldest son. If there wasn't an, uh, an oldest son, it went to the second son, which is called, in, uh, in these circles, it's, uh, the second son is called the second person, meaning they would be the king except for they've got an older brother. Okay, well, if there wasn't a son that was eligible, then the oldest daughter would sometimes come up, but usually they do everything they could to try to have a man on the throne. All right, so you've got Henry the Sixth, who was who was weak and did not well. He married Margaret Beaufort, who was a very smart, very powerful woman herself, having some connection to the line of the throne. But uh, these are the House of Lancaster, the House of York. Richard, Duke of York, had three sons. His sons were Edward of York, was the oldest. George, the Duke of Clarence, was the second, and the third was Richard of Gloucester. Those three brothers joined forces and fought Henry VI and took the throne away from him, and he later died. So now, the throne passed from the House of Lancaster at this point over to the House of York. Edward of York, the oldest son of the House of York, 
became Edward IV. He had uh, he was married to again a very significant woman. They, uh, her name was uh, was Elizabeth of Woodville. The Woodvilles also had a claim to the throne. That's one of the things that they would do is in order to strengthen their claim to the throne, they would try to marry somebody else from a royal lineage. So Edward IV and his wife had actually, I think, seven children. But of the seven children, the ones that were historically important are Mary of York, who's their oldest daughter, and then two sons, Edward V and Richard, who later became known as the princes in the tower, and I'll tell you why. So Edward of York, who was Edward IV, thought, I'm in good shape. I've got two heirs. If my son Edward dies, you know, he would be Edward V. If my son Edward dies, I have another son right behind him. They were, you know, and, and uh, I'll get the ages in a minute. Well, George, the Duke of Clarence, the king's brother, wa wanted to be king. He was the second person, meaning he had no claim to anything. He was very wealthy, though. The areas he controlled as the Duke of Clarence were, were made him very wealthy. He wanted to be king, and so he started plotting against his brother. Now, the three brothers, Edward, George, and Richard, had all fought together to gain the throne for the House of York. But once Edward the, became Edward IV, his brother Richard, or his brother um, George, wanted to take it away from him. Mm -hmm. Eventually, he was arrested, and he and some of his co-conspirators were executed. So Edward IV had his old, his next brother George executed for treason. <laughs> he had one brother left. That was Richard. Well, unexpectedly, and whenever you say unexpectedly, there was always a question of foul play, Edward fell ill. He went on a fishing trip, he came back, he got very sick, he died. He had a fever for a while and died. Nobody, he was still a fairly young man, nobody expected it. So, since Edward IV had died, the heir to the throne was Edward V. He was only 12 years old at that point. Now, that wasn't unusual. It was not uncommon in Europe to have people younger than that assume the throne. And, and frequently they would do so with a regent. Regent basically meant an adult who ran things in the name of the king because they were too young until they got old enough. Well, Richard of Gloucester, the younger brother of Edward and George, uh, who he also had desires to be king. So he got the parliament to agree that he would be regent. At first the parliament was ready to you know, to have an ordination for Edward V, even though he's only 12 years old, to make him the king. Well, Richard had a lot of influential friends, because he too was wealthy. He convinced them that he should be regent, and he had Edward, uh, his nephew Edward, and the younger nephew Richard, which was, who was like four years younger than Edward, taken to the Tower of London. Now, we always think Tower of London means something bad. The Tower of London was actually where a lot of royalty stayed. Um, it's also where they had prisoners, but they took, he took the two sons there. He um, got position as regent. While they were uh, keeping Edward and Richard the boy in the tower, Richard had his brother's marriage to Elizabeth Woodville declared illegitimate. That, and he said he was actually married to somebody else before he married uh, Elizabeth. Woodville, and so therefore the marriage was declared illegal, and the, the children were therefore declared illegitimate. And if they're illegitimate, they don't have a right to claim the throne. And so if Edward IV did not have an heir who could legally claim the throne anymore, because they were now illegitimate, according to Parliament, because Richard, the, Richard convinced them, then Richard became Richard III. So the youngest of the three uh, York brothers became Richard III. The two princes... Who Edward, who would have become Edward V if he had become the king, and he didn't, and then Richard, his younger brother, were called the princes in the tower because they were kept in the tower. They were seen less and less frequently until finally they disappeared altogether. <laughs> there, um, they were murdered. I mean, everybody understood, even their mother, Elizabeth Woodville, finally understood that they had been killed. And then later on, a report came from one of the wardens of the tower that he'd been ordered by Richard uh, who became Richard III, to smother them in their sleep, and so they were killed. Well, the problem is, when that story got out that Richard, in order to become king, had smothered his two nephews, or age 8 and 12, then a lot of people started opposing him. He wasn't so popular anymore. And so he was struggling to try to maintain power. Well, when Henry VI had been defeated by Edward IV, or the guy who became Edward IV, his wife, very smart lady, royal blood, Margaret Beaufort,
took their son, who's, who was named Henry Tudor, and went first to Wales, where they had property, and then fled to the continent. And many years passed while all this is going on, you know, while Edward the, the Fourth is having kids, and etc., etc. So Henry has grown into a young man. Margaret Bof uh, Beaufort and her son Henry on the continent, Margaret Beaufort approaches the woman, Ed, um, Edward IV's wife, uh, Elizabeth Woodville, and says, I have a proposition for you. This guy, your brother-in-law, Richard III, now king, killed your kids. And he may have been responsible for killing your husband, since it was suspicious. I have an idea. How about if we take my son, Henry Tudor, and have him marry your daughter, who is one of the oldest children there, Mary of York. Therefore, we will join the houses of Lancaster and the house of York. We will end the War of the Roses. And it was called the War of the Roses because the badge or the symbol for the house of Lancaster was a red rose, and for the house of York was a white rose. <laughs> so the idea that Margaret Beaufort had and approached Elizabeth Woodville is, you don't want your brother-in-law who killed your two sons to be king. Let's marry our two children. And with that, because there were people on the House of York side who did not trust Richard anymore, the idea that one of the children of Edward was marrying the rightful heir from the House of Lancaster, they got people from both houses supporting them. So um, Henry Tudor landed on the coast in England. Richard III went to fight him with an army. So these two armies are getting ready to meet. Richard III thought he's going to be really bold, and he charges down the hill to try to challenge uh, Henry Tudor to a one-on-one -on -one combat, ends up getting killed. And Richard III is one of Shakespeare's plays. Okay, um, Not very accurate, but it's one of Shakespeare's plays. So Richard III is now dead. Henry Tudor claims the throne as Henry VII, now married to Mary, Mary of York, and they form the House of Tudor. A combination of the House of Lancaster and the House of York, they are the House of Tudor, right? Now, the reason why all of that's important is you need to understand what a horrible circumstance England had gone through trying to figure out who is the rightful king. These wars of uh, accession, you know, the, the idea of who is going to ascend to the throne, you know, a lot of people had died, people had been murdered, children smothered in their sleep. It had been a horrible time for England, this whole War of the Roses thing. And nobody wanted to go back to that, and it all had to do with a question of who has the most rightful claim to the throne. Right? That was the issue that everybody was concerned about. Well, Henry VIII and his wife Mary of York, they have an oldest son named Arthur. And Arthur, they named him Arthur because of remembering the historic King Arthur. He was going to unite all of England and all of that kind of stuff, right? Um, and then they have other children. But Arthur, they are preparing him for the throne. They're preparing him to be the king of England. As part of that, typically in this time period, you have England and Scotland, and they were not one country yet. Um, Scotland almost always aligned themselves with France as an ally. And this is going to come up later when we talk about the Scottish Reformation. Britain, or I'm sorry, England, always aligned themselves with Spain. And whenever it came, you know, when England was fighting with France, Spain would be an ally. And when France was fighting with England, Scotland would, you know, attack the northern border of England. And that's just the way it went. Those were the alliances. Well, as part of that, Henry VII and Mary of York uh, agree that their son, Arthur Tudor, is going to marry Catherine of Aragon. She is the Spanish daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella. So you know what time period we're talking about here now, right? The, toward the end of the 15th century, the 1400s. Because it was Ferdinand and Isabella that, found, that funded Columbus's trip to the New World in 1492. 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. You guys know this. So we're looking at the end of the 15th century. Now remember, the, Ref, the, the Reformation technically, starting with Luther in 1517. So we're only looking at about 20 years before Luther here at the most. All right, so Arthur Tudor marries Catherine of Aragon, who is the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain, and to build that link. Unfortunately, Arthur dies a short time later. And then the heir to the throne is the second son of Henry VII and Mary of York, 
whose name is also Henry. When he gets old enough, he assumes the throne, and he is Henry VIII. I am Henry VIII, I am Henry VIII, I am, I am. Okay, you know that song, right? Okay, so Catherine of Aragon has been married to Arthur Tudor. The Spanish royalty come back to Henry VII, and they say, look, we still want to have this strong alliance with you, so why don't we have your first son's widow, our daughter Catherine of Aragon, now marry your second son, Henry VIII. That way she'll become Queen of England. You guys will still have a strong link to, to Spain. We'll support you, blah, 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 blah. Well, that all sounds good except for one problem. There is a law, a church law, a canon law, which says, by the, according to the Catholic Church, everybody's Catholics here at this point, canon law says a person cannot marry his brother's widow. Now, that's, con that's opposite of the Jewish idea that you have to marry your brother's widow. And part of it is because it was a Catholic thing they did to, to differentiate, you know, they didn't like the Jews a lot of times, and so they had passed a canon law that a man could not marry his brother's widow if his brother died. They, the representatives in England, because they really want this to happen, they go to the Pope and they get special permission, a papal dispensation, for Catherine now to marry Arthur, or I'm sorry, uh, Henry VIII, after her first husband Arthur has died. Right? So now you've got Henry VIII married to his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. Now, what is the big deal that everybody has been struggling with for the last several generations? The right to have an heir to the throne. An heir to the throne means a son. So, the, the big goal, after all of this other murder and mayhem has happened, Henry VIII, the whole royal family, and all of England, wants to have a legal heir to the throne. Catherine does not have a son. She tries and tries and tries. She, in fact, they say that she's been over 10 years pregnant. There are pictures of, you know, paintings of her made after this. She'd been a very attractive woman. Well, later on, when when Henry is still quite vibrant, he had been very athletic. He'd been, you know, a good-looking man early. You see the pictures of him like this. That's not what he looked like in his job. Um, and yet Catherine, by being pregnant pretty much constantly for ten years, you know, she was gained weight. She didn't look good. Her skin wasn't good. Well, for all of that, she kept trying to have a son, and she couldn't. The best she had, uh, miscarriage after miscarriage. Finally, she has a daughter, who is Mary Tudor of the House of Tudor, right? So, Henry has a daughter, but that doesn't help him. There are other people who are liable to step forward from the House of York or one of the other, you know, there, there's a family called the Greys that have a very strong claim to the throne, and others, because so many of these people were descended from Edward III. And a, there were a lot of people who could claim that they had a right to the throne over a daughter, a male who could claim, I have more of a right to the throne than she does. So Henry is finally, there's no indication that um, he had a particular problem with Catherine when they were married, but after she's unable to produce a male heir, the government, Henry himself, plus his advisors, decide you need to be married to somebody else to get a male heir. So they go to the Pope and they ask for an annulment, where the marriage is declared never having to be, been valid. Well, the, the, the basis of that is they argue that the Pope, the previous Pope, who had given him permission to marry his, his brother's widow, was not valid. The first Pope was wrong. They should never have given him permission to do that. Therefore, the marriage is not valid. And they argue that and argue that. But, as always, politics comes in here. I've mentioned several times during the whole Reformation period the Holy Roman Emperor. Remember who that was? Charles V. Charles V was the Holy Roman Emperor. He controlled most of Europe. He also, at this point, pretty much controlled the Pope. The Pope was in his pocket because he was the most powerful leader in, in Europe. He and Francis I, the King of France, are fighting back and forth. Well, it just so happened that Catherine of Aragon was Charles V's aunt. The Holy Roman Emperor is the nephew of Catherine of Aragon, the Holy Roman Emperor is really controlling the Pope at this point. The Pope does not want to offend the Holy Roman Emperor, and yet Catherine of Aragon appeals to her nephew, Charles V, and says, they're trying to say that my marriage is not legitimate, set me aside, make my daughter 
illegitimate, and don't let them do that to me. And so Charles V tells the Pope, you're not going to annul this marriage. <laughs> and it goes back and forth and back and forth. Henry is getting more and more frustrated and more and more frustrated about this whole thing. He even he has illegitimate children by other people, and at one point, he somebody proposes that one of his, his children, that he has made the Earl of Darnley, I think it is, um, that they declare him. And Henry says, that doesn't help me because he's not, he's illegitimate. I, he, it, we can't say he's the heir to the throne. Nobody wants to go back to the time where you're smothering children in their sleep in order to get to be king. <clears throat> and so getting this resolved is a huge issue. Um, they eventually, Thomas Cranmer <coughs> was the Archbishop of Canterbury. He was a close friend and advisor of Henry. He had, Henry had actually twisted the Pope's arm at one point and gotten him to name um, Thomas Cranmer as the Archbishop of Canterbury, which was the most important religious position in the Catholic Church in England. Well, Cranmer is the primary uh, counsel to Henry, and Cranmer comes up with the idea, look, let's poll the great Catholic universities across Europe and ask them for their opinion about whether or not your marriage to Catherine was illegal or not, according to church law, canon law. Which that's the point they're trying to make is. The marriage isn't valid anyway, so we can set it aside and I can marry somebody who can have a boy. They poll all of the, you know, not only Oxford, but Paris and Toulouse and all, and even churches and uh, even universities in Italy, Catholic universities, for their interpretation of canon law. And pretty much all of them come back and go, yeah, that, that annulment, I mean, that permission that you received, Henry, to marry Catherine should never have happened. That's, a, that's plainly against the law, the canon law. So, finally, Henry starts taking steps that separate the church in England from the Pope. Now, he's not talking about any other reformation at this point. The whole issue is whether the Pope can tell him what to do. And so he starts re, um, reaffirming ancient laws that had said things like, any legal decision made in England cannot be appealed outside England, which means you can't go to, you can't go to the Pope and ask his opinion on it. That had previously been a law, they reenacted it. The law that you can't send money that's raised inside England to a foreign uh, power. Well, Rome was a foreign power, the Pope was a foreign power, so he stopped getting money from England. <laughs> Eventually, um, Cranmer ruled, the universities are right, your marriage to Catherine of Aragon should never have happened, therefore you should be free, the marriage should be annulled. At this point, Henry approaches the Parliament, and the Parliament passes laws that say, one, the Pope is no longer over the Church of England, the King of England is the head of the Church of England. Anybody that disagrees, anybody that calls Henry a schismatic, meaning splitting the church, or, or a heretic, or anything else negative, anyone who does not affirm that he is now the legal head of the Church of England is guilty of treason and will be executed for treason. They also pass all these other laws to sort of gain control of the clergy, etc. Now, most of the church in England went along with this without a problem. There were a few major players who did have a problem. One of them was Sir Thomas More, who was the Chancellor of England and had been one of Henry's closest friends. He was a devout Catholic and he said, I'm sorry Henry, but you don't have the right to say that you're head of the church. You're a layman. You have no religious background. You have no right to this. He was arrested. He, um, you know, there's a famous scene where his daughter, who was quite scholarly, went to him with a whole list of people who had affirmed that now Henry's the head of the church in England. And Moore, Thomas More famously said, I will not pin my conscience on some other man's back. You know, I have to do this. Well, he, um, in his defense, when they presented him with the, the case, he was tried for treason, he said, you know, I haven't... You can't convict any, somebody for what they didn't say. And all I haven't said is that the king is now the head of the church in England. And so he sort of tried to wiggle out of it. They didn't accept that. He was found guilty. And then when he was being, just before his execution, he said, I die a loyal servant of the king, but more a servant of God. And they executed the chancellor of England, Thomas More, for not, for not agreeing to this. Well... The church in England is now completely separate from the Pope, but it hasn't changed in any way other than um, the Pope isn't in charge. Everything else is the same. The Pope isn't in charge. It's also true that Henry destroyed all the monasteries. You know, he took the, the property of the monasteries. 
He disbanded them. If you travel through England now, you will come upon these spectacular ruins all over the country, which were the, the, the remains of the monasteries that Henry took over. And he took all their money and all of the wealth and all of the land to sort of pay for running his own church now. Okay? But the monasteries were done away with. A primary reason for that was the monasteries had a pretty, pretty good gig under the Pope. You know, we talked before about the fact that at this point the monasteries were kind of like, you know, uh, fraternities. People went there and party. They had, you know, soirees. It was a social time. Well, they didn't want to lose that, and so they were prepared to defend the Pope, and that's why Henry disassembled the monasteries all over England. But other than those couple of things, the church was pretty much the same as it was before. Now, there were people, including Thomas Cranmer, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury, who had agreed that now Henry VIII was the head of the church in England. Um, Cranmer was one of the people who hoped that what was going to happen here is that once the king is the head of the church and not the pope, we can begin to reform the church, to do some of the things that the Protestant reformers, like you know, Swingley had already been talking about it, John Wycliffe in England had talked about this earlier, John Hus in Bohemia, Cranmer and others wanted the church to become uh, more what the New Testament church was and less what the popes had made it. But that was going to be a slow process. Henry was clearly, Henry VIII was clearly not in favor of Protestantism. In fact, earlier, before his split with the pope, um, Henry, who was quite, you know, Henry VIII is famous for a lot of reasons, like having a lot of wives. But he also was brilliant. Uh, again, he was athletic, he was handsome, he apparently was a strong leader. And he was quite scholarly. One of the things that happened is because his brother Arthur was being prepared to be the king and the ruler, most of his early life, Henry was being, being educated as though he wasn't going to have those responsibilities. And so he learned Latin and he learned Greek and he, you know, he was quite scholarly and he learned the affairs of, basically got raised by women instead of men. You know, his mother and his sisters, he lived with them up until the point that his brother died. And then, he, then they started teaching him how to be a soldier and how to be a, a king and that sort of thing. But he had all of that background. Prior to the split with Rome, uh, when Luther was making all of this noise by now, um, Henry VIII wrote a treatise against Luther. In fact, it was so effective that the Pope declared or gave the title Defender of the Faith to Henry VIII. Mm -hmm. all right? So he had the declaration that he was the defender of the Catholic faith prior to all of the split. So um, in no way did Henry VIII want to change or reform the church. Cranmer and others did, but he just wanted the Pope not to be in charge anymore so he could do what he thought he had to do to run his own country. For Henry, the only issue was whether or not the King of England has the right to do what he has to do to run his, <clears throat> run his country. And that involved having a male heir. And the Pope wasn't letting him deal with that, so he decided the Pope didn't, didn't tell him what to do anymore. You're not the boss of the Pope, okay? <laughs> So, Catherine of Aragon, as soon as the Parliament votes that he is the head of the Church of England, he announces that his marriage to Catherine Aragon, of Aragon is annulled. Now, by this time, he had earlier met, and he said he'd been working for a long time for the annulment before he even met Anne Boleyn. What had happened was he actually had had one of his mistresses had been Anne Boleyn's sister. There's a movie out, which I haven't seen, the, the Other Boleyn Girl, which is about her sister. She had been Henry VIII's mistress, one of his mistresses. He was a prolific man. Um, and he had, after a while, just sent her away, just set her aside. Well, Anne Boleyn did not want to happen to her with the same thing that had happened to her sister. So after Henry kept propositioning her, and she said, no, I'm not going to sleep with you unless you marry me. Now. Henry had already been trying to get into Noma before his relationship with Anne Boleyn, but Anne Boleyn, you know, she was, she was controlling it. She was really calling the shots. Eventually, before the annulment happened, Henry had secretly married Anne Boleyn. Apparently, they'd had relations before, before the marriage, but it took a long time for Henry to wear her down. And then they married each other. In fact, when he got into the annulment uh, officially from Catherine of Aragon, he married uh, Anne Boleyn a short time later. But that was a public marriage. They had secretly been married while he was still married to Catherine of Aragon. Okay. Um, so, they get married. Very complicated. You know, there's, telenovelas have nothing on history. So, Anne Boleyn, they're married, and he apparently loved her. She does not produce a male heir. 
she produces another daughter whose name is Elizabeth. Well, after a period of time, part, and we don't know how much of this was frustration with her inability to produce a male heir, and by the way, they always blamed the woman back then. Now we know that, that it's the man's fault if, you know, if a, man, a male is not born. They didn't accept that. Okay. So, after a period of time, Anne is accused, and we don't know if Henry had this happen because he was frustrated with her or what, has her accused of uh, adultery, and she's beheaded. So she's executed. He then marries Jane Seymour. Now, Jane Seymour had been a lady-in-waiting to Anne Boleyn and to, Cath to Catherine of Aragon. She was not of nobility. She was the daughter of a knight, but she was not of the par with everybody else. Interestingly enough, um, Henry really liked her, and she gave him a male heir, a male heir in terms of Edward VI. She then died for like 12 days later, 12 or 14 days later. They believe in complications uh, after the birth. And Edward is not healthy. Okay, he's he's a sickly child for a long you know a long time. But there is now a male heir. But when Jane Seymour died, and again Henry apparently had great affection for her, he marries a fourth wife, Anne of Cleves. Now interestingly enough, at this point Henry has decided that because the relationship with with the Spanish has not gone well. Remember, he annulled his marriage to, to Catherine of Aragon. He decides, I need to get in more with the Germans. Well, at this point, the German princes have mostly gone over to the Protestant side. So he decides he wants to develop a relationship with the Lutherans, for heaven's sake, <laughs> for political reasons. All of this is politically motivated. All right? So Anne of Cleves, who he called, and the, the tradition is, although scholars say this probably isn't true, he called her his Flanders mayor. Um, Anne of Cleves, they get married, and um, she does not produce any children. After a period of time, he has that marriage annulled. No children. And besides that, by the time after he marries her, thinking he's going to develop a link, because she's a Protestant, he's going to develop a link with the Lutherans, then um, Charles V and Henry VIII start talking in negotiations in order for both of them to gang up on Francis I of France. Well, now he's got relations with the Holy Roman Emperor, who also speaks for the Spanish court, because he's also the King of Spain. Um, and he's saying, I don't need the Lutherans anymore. Why would I need the German Protestants? I've got the Spanish back in my side, and I've got the Holy Roman Emperor. So, shoo, <laughs> go away. <laughs> And he annuls, because he's now the head of the church, he annuls the marriage to Anna Cleves. Then he marries a woman, Catherine Howard. Um, it lasts a little over a year. She's accused of adultery, and apparently really was guilty of it, because he identified the man, and she is beheaded for adultery. So, um, we got two down by beheading, two annulments, <laughs> and one death after childbirth. And, mar and then he marries a sixth time, Catherine Parr. Now, interestingly enough, um, by the way, I should say, Anna Cleves, when I say shoe, he actually continued to be friends with her. She was, she was a friend after they got divorced. He, he remained, he spoke well of her, and they were, they were friends after that. The shoeing part was just the legal, you know, you know, I need somebody else who, I don't need you politically anymore, I like you, but I'm looking for another, a guarantor heir. Remember, in the same way that Edward had two heirs because you always needed a reserve because a lot of people died back in those days. Um, he's looking for a second person. He, Henry wants a second son to be a guarantor that his line is going to continue that somebody else won't challenge him. So he marries Catherine Parr. Now Catherine Parr also apparently Henry thought very well of her. Catherine Parr created a home for them and she was the one that turned this into a family. She is the one responsible for making Henry, in his, in his old age now, or I mean, he died fairly young, he was old when he died, but in his you know, later years, um, really sort of take responsibility as a family man. And he created a home in which these three children, by different mothers, all felt like they belonged to the family, even though they had some major disagreements, which are going to come up later. But Catherine Parr was so well thought of that when Henry goes off for like a last gambit fighting in France, he makes Catherine the regent of all England. She's in charge. In fact, he says that if he dies, she will maintain regency until his son, Edward, comes to, comes to age, comes of age. So he really liked the two wives that he seemed to, to 
life even after, you know, uh, Anacles he maintained friendship with and Catherine Parr. Now, Catherine Parr and Anacles both survived him. They both lived longer than he did. Okay. Um, now, as Henry is approaching the end of his life, and toward the end of his life, he, you know, he had, he had done what a lot of the kings did. Edward did this. He got fat. He got unhealthy. Um, he, he was in bad shape. So, before he dies, partly we be they believe by influence of Catherine Parr, who had tried to make all of the three children, who weren't hers, feel like part of the family, we believe that she convinced Henry to create a, a, pl a plan of succession that would benefit all three of his children. Now, because um, Edward, while he was, the, he was the youngest of the three children, he was the male. He would be the primary heir. But the plan of succession which Henry drafted and which the Parliament then approved said that in the event that Edward dies, the next in order of succession would be the two daughters in order of birth. Mary Tudor, first, the daughter of uh, Catherine of Aragon, and then Elizabeth, the daughter of Jane Seymour. Okay, that's why you see them. Yeah. Seven, eight, nine. Oh, I'm sorry, of, of Anne Boleyn. Um, and the Parliament accepted that, and it was locked into law. Okay, we um, we then get to when Henry dies, his heir uh, Edward the Sixth takes over. The first three years, and he's he's still a child. He's like what twelve, and so he has regents. The regents that are uh, for him are uh, various uh, two dukes and a. Let's see where are my notes here? Uh, okay. First, the Duke of Somerset, the Earl of Warwick, and the Duke of Northumberland. Now, this is in 1547. This is 30 years after Luther nails the the um, 95 theses. But Edward the Sixth has these regents who are ruling for him, but he's a very smart young man. He's been well trained, and he has his own very strong ideas. Because his regents and his other advisors are primarily Protestants, and you remember, Henry VIII did not want to change the church. He just wanted to get rid of the authority of the Pope and let him run the country the way he wanted to. So at this point, because of the influence of Cranmer, who wanted to reform the church, and the 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 Duke of Somerset, the Earl of Warwick, and the Duke of Northumberland, all of whom were regents, sort of the, running the country in the name of Edward VI, they were all Protestants, and there was a lot of influence to try to do more than just be, be not under the Pope, but to change it. And so, with Edward's authority, even though he was a child, and he only ruled for three years, the uh, clergy could marry, they got rid of a lot of the formal feast days and the requirements for, you know, uh, Lenten fasting and all of that. They instituted the uh, elements in both kinds. You remember what that means, that the lay people got both the bread and the wine. They got rid of a lot of the icons in the church that they felt were, uh, you know, were idolatry. There was a move to, to become a lot of the things that Luther and Zwingli and Calvin, you know, were saying the church ought to be. Uh, much of it was because this, this boy, Edward, between age 12 and 15, with the support of his advisors and the recommendation of his advisors, but he had a very strong feeling about it, he instituted these changes. And the, the, the church in England became very Protestant. You know, it looked very much like what the Protestant churches on the continent looked like. And Catholicism was done away with, pretty much. And any of the Catholics... There was not persecution at this point, but any of the Catholics who did not go along with the program were invited to find somewhere else to live. Right? So, now not exiled, not forced out, but told, hey, this is the way it's going to be. You can either stick around and be with the program or, you know, or call that number to find out how you can become one of the drivers or one of the big rigs. Okay? You're not going to be a priest anymore if you're not going to go along with this. All right? Um, so... Edward only lives to age 15. He dies in 1553. When he dies, before he dies, he actually tries to put in place his own plan of succession. Why? Because his half-sister, Mary Tudor, is a rabid Catholic. Now, why is she a rabid Catholic? Think about it for a second. Her mother, Catherine of Aragon, was from Catholic Spain. The Pope did not want for this marriage between Henry and Catherine to be annulled. When they did annul it, not by the Pope, 
you know, not by the Catholic Church annulling it, but by a split from the Catholic Church, that made Mary Tudor an illegitimate child. Her marriage, the marriage between her mother and Henry VIII was no longer legitimate. She was an illegitimate child, which means they could potentially challenge her right to the throne based upon the decision that was made against the Catholic Church in favor of this new Protestant Church of England. So she's rooting for the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church makes her the legitimate heir and rightful ruler of England. The Protestant Church, there was a danger, they'd come back and go, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You're an illegitimate child. You don't have any right to the throne, even though Henry VIII had written a plan of succession that was approved. Well, so <coughs> Edward VI does not want his half-sister Mary to become the queen because he knows what's going to happen. She's going to turn around and turn it into a Catholic country again. So even though he's 15 years old when he gets sick and they realize that it's, it's terminal, he writes his own plan for succession. And he looks around and says, who else is there that potentially could become king or queen that's Protestant? Well, he can't look to his sister Elizabeth, who is Protestant, because her mother, you know, well... Um, because she's younger and she, people would say, no, you can't say her because Mary Tudor has a right before she does. He has cousins who are of the house of Gray. The Grays are all Protestants and they have probably second only to Henry VIII's children, one of the closest uh, or the, the strongest rights to claim the throne. And so 15 year old Edward VI, and we, they have this document in England, he hand wrote his plan of succession. And in it, he wrote that the oldest of the gray, the problem was there weren't any male grays at that point. They were all women. And so that created a problem. So he wrote, I saw, I saw a documentary on this, he wrote in this plan of succession that Lady Jane Gray's heir will be the king. And then, as he approached his own death and realized that she doesn't have a kid yet, she's probably not going to before I go, he, he marked out Jane Grey's heir and said, Lady Jane Grey will be heir to the throne. Have you guys seen the movie with Mary, uh, um, uh, Bonham Carter, what's her first name? Helena. Helena Bonham Carter, Lady Jane Grey? Mm -hmm. What happened was, Edward dies. He has written this plan of succession as the king. Remember, Henry had written a plan of succession when he was king. Edward VI writes a plan of succession, even though he's only 15 years old. Then Lady Jane Grey is going to be the queen after he dies. Well, they go and get Lady Jane Grey and bring her to London. She is in the tower. Again, that doesn't mean she's in prison at this point. There were apartments in the tower. And Mary Tudor quickly steps up and says, Hey, I am now the queen. My father's will, the rule of the parliament, the law makes me the queen. Well, they have enough people on her side, even though they're not real keen about a Catholic queen, because she's not made a big deal of this yet, but um, they say, yeah, you're the queen, Lady Jane Grey's not. Well, she, Lady Jane Grey only lived for 12 days. <laughs> okay? That's what, there's a, the movie about that, you know, the very short life of Lady Jane Grey. She wasn't asking for this. You know, her cousin, Edward VI, did this because he was trying to put a Protestant on the throne, even if it was a woman, his cousin. Okay, so, Mary Tudor becomes the queen. At first, she lays kind of low. She doesn't make a big deal out of it because she needs to consolidate her resources and her authority. But she fairly quickly does that. And so, she then starts, once she feels like her political, you know, legs are planted, she starts moving toward changing back to Catholicism. And so she begins to institute laws as technically she's the head of the church, right? So first she starts out saying that the feast days of the saints are restored. She says that any married clergy have to set their wives aside. You have to get rid of your wives, you can't be married anymore. Um, she begins to openly persecute Protestant leaders. In fact, almost every Protestant leader in England at this point either flees to the continent, they go to Strasbourg or Geneva or someplace like that, um, or they're executed. In fact, in the few short years that she ruled, which was only about uh, five years, Mary 
killed so many people, or was responsible for having them executed, that she, she got the title Bloody Mary. Now, it's fair to say that, you know, um, when Elizabeth becomes queen, which we'll talk about in just a second, about the same number of people were executed under Elizabeth's reign as under Mary's reign, but Elizabeth ruled for 50 years, not five. So it's not apples and oranges, you know, it's not apples and apples. So Mary reestablishes Catholicism. She reestablishes relationships with the Pope. The Pope again becomes the head of the, the church in England. And a lot of people flee. Over 300 are burned at the stake fairly, fairly soon after she starts reestablishing this. In fact, in 1561, which is after Mary's death, um, there is published a famous book, which is Fox's Book of Martyrs. Fox's Book of Martyrs, originally, Matthew Fox, who wrote this, was intending for it to be a story of martyrdom down through the histories. In fact, it has a little bit, of the start of it talks about some of the martyrs, Christian martyrs under the, the Roman rule. But the vast majority of the book came to be the stories of the martyrs under Mary Tudor, Mary I. Um, and what gave her, it's probably that that gave her the name Bloody Mary, because in addition to having the stories of all these people that she had killed, she also, uh, they also have woodcuts, very vivid woodcuts, woodcuts of women being burned at the stake and who were pregnant and having their unborn child, you know, spilling out of them and all kinds of very vivid woodcuts. So this, this really biased everybody against Mary. It also created a sympathy for the Protestants in England throughout pretty much the whole world. In fact, a lot of Catholics were influenced against Mary and against the Catholic Reformation in England because of uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs. We, there's a copy out of the library, the new Fox's Book of Martyrs, which actually they've added chapters for martyrs in subsequent centuries. You know, like there's 20, 20th century martyrs that are listed in there and stories of them. So, Mary reigns for five years, um, and part of the, you know, one of the, one of the major martyrs for her was Archbishop of Canterbury Cram, Cranmer, who was the one responsible for being supporter of her father, Henry VIII, uh, although he was the one that recommended that Catherine of Aragon, Mary Tudor's mother, be set aside in an annulment. So she takes great pleasure in declaring Thomas Cranmer a heretic. They uh, refer the case to Rome, and Rome burns him in effigy, declares him technically a heretic by the Pope, uh, but they tell Mary, you deal with him, you know, they're in England. And so, they make Thomas Cranmer watch from his jail cell while two of his closest friends and colleagues, Bishops Hugh Latimer and, and Nicholas Ridley, are burned at the stake. They then tell, uh, and Mary's big deal is she wants him to recant of his opposition to Catholicism and to, to confess you know, his sins and to rejoin the Catholic Church. That's going to be a political victory for her. And at first, um, he does recant. He recants in writing and says he was wrong in all of this. Well, usually the, the policy was if somebody recanted, then they were, you know, they were forgiven, they were let off. But Mary has a grudge against Cranmer, and so she says, all right, he's going to burn at the stake. In fact, we're going to make a big show of this. They make special arrangements in the Church of St. Mary. In fact, again, documentaries I've seen. If you go to the Church of St. Mary uh, in London now, there are pillars where they cut notches out of the stone in order to build a high platform so that everybody in the church could see Cranmer, because they expected he was going to get up, and he was going to re, uh, restate his recantation. In other words, he was going to again say, I was wrong, this was a sin, the Catholic Church is right, the Pope is right. Well, he gets up to speak, and they think he's going to say all the right things, and instead, he withdraws his recantation and says, the Pope is wrong. In fact, he includes in it these words. These words were written contrary to the truth which I thought in my heart, and written for fear of death, to save my life if it might be. And for as much as I have written many things contrary to what I believe in my heart, my hand shall first be punished. For if I may come to the fire, it shall first be burned. As for the Pope, I refuse him for Christ's enemy and Antichrist with all his false doctrine. This was a public relations nightmare for Mary and for Catholics. So, because they made a big deal of it, you know, they, they, it was on the internet, they saw everybody could see. But they had a huge crowd, everybody was talking about it, and, and Cranmer backs up and says, no, I shouldn't have done this. 
when they actually take him from there out to the stake, and they put him, you know, tie him to the stake, and they light the fire, he's true to what he said, he holds his hand out to where the flames are before they've gotten to the point they can kill him, and holds his hand in the fire until it's charred. Mm -hmm. And then he dies in the flames. That act, and he was an old man by now, that act of letting, and he said, my hand will be burned first for what it has done in writing these false words. That act took him from being a, uh, you know, somebody who recanted the Protestant side and went to Catholicism to being a major hero in the history of Protestantism for the people of that day and ever since then. And so he became, again, Mary's worst nightmare. He, he became a symbol, a martyr to so many of the Protestants, all right? Now, five years after she takes over, in 1558, Mary dies. And she is succeeded, according to the original plan that her father, Henry VIII, had gotten put in place by the Parliament. She is succeeded by her sister, Elizabeth I. Now, Elizabeth is a Protestant. Protestant, Catholic, Protestant, okay? Uh, but Elizabeth I who rules for 50 years and is still to this day considered one of the very best rulers Britain ever had, maybe one of the best rulers anybody ever had, she comes on board and she immediately identifies the fact that, that the England is going to go back to being a Protestant nation, but no one is going to be persecuted. Everybody is going to be given a fair, a fair chance. Her goal, in fact, is... To, to establish what later on becomes, uh, becomes called the Via Media, the middle way between Catholicism and Protestantism as it had been practiced. Between the radical, you know, her, her brother, who even though he died at 15, had instituted what seemed fairly radical Protestant practices in England. Turn around and Mary produces very radical Catholic practices. Elizabeth says she is going to find the middle way. And she is going to, well, while she accepts Zwingli and Calvinist ideals, and she welcomes them there. And in fact, some of these reformers and, and Protestants start coming back to England. In fact, they're streaming back to England after, after Elizabeth. She makes it clear that she is a Protestant, but she is not going to be a radical Protestant. Now, why is she a Protestant? Well, because in the same way, Mary Tudor defended Catholicism because the Protestants had said that she was illegitimate. The Catholics claimed that Elizabeth was illegitimate in order to then to still defend Catherine and Mary Tudor. You know, after all of this was done, the Catholics still kept crowing, no, you know, Elizabeth and Edward uh, can't be heirs to the throne. It has to be the child of Catherine of Aragon because her marriage is still legitimate. The Catholic Church was still saying, Elizabeth and Edward are not rightful heirs. They're illegitimate because their mothers were not really married to Henry because he never got unmarried to Catherine of Aragon. Okay? So for the same reason that Mary Tudor defended Catholicism, because without it she would be illegitimate, Elizabeth, although she personally, yeah, her convictions were Protestant, she had to defend Protestantism for political reasons, because without Protestantism that meant Catherine and her daughter Mary Tudor were, were legitimate and Elizabeth wasn't. You see this? How much politics has affected all of this stuff? They're political issues. But Elizabeth is a Protestant, but not a Protestant extremist. She tries to unite the whole kingdom in common worship. She has, for instance, a new uh, edition of the Book of Common Prayer. Now, previously, there had been two editions of the Book of Common Prayer. The first one had said, for instance, in, in part of the rite, it said, The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you, preserve your body and soul into everlasting life. The idea that supported the concept of transubstantiation, and, and there were other words that seemed to support the idea that this, the Mass, the communion of the Mass, was a re-sacrificing of Jesus, very Catholic idea. Later on, under... Um, and this was under Edward, they had a version of it that read, take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for thee, and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving, which are words that I use in communion. Uh, but take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you. That's a very softer, more Protestant thing to say. It's not, this is the very body and blood of Jesus Christ, you know, transubstantiated, literally, da da da. Well, under Elizabeth, she put both of those statements together. So the people who took a more traditional Catholic view could read the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, Christ which was given for thee, preserve thy body and soul into everlasting life. Which sounds like they could interpret that as transubstantiation. 
But right after that, it said, take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for thee, and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. She came out with a new edition, which really could be accepted by all sides, depending upon which part of it they chose to focus on. Right? Now, um, this whole idea then was followed up with, with what's called the 39 articles, which are still the basic articles of sort of incorporation of faith of the Anglican and Episcopal churches. The 39 articles, which were published in 1562, is the doctrinal foundation, but in fact, um, it, it starts out uh, renouncing certain Catholic doctrines, like the doctrine of transubstantiation. It explicitly rejects, in fact, some of the Catholic doctrines. But then, it leaves things quite wide open. It does not attempt to choose between the various Protestant ideas that were out there. It doesn't affirm Lutheran, Luther's idea of what happens in communion or Swingley's. It doesn't address you know, any of those issues. It leaves it open. And again, this was part of the vehement the middle way that, that Elizabeth was trying to walk. Um, and that continues to be the case with the Anglican communion today. You know, they take pride in the fact that they're not Catholic. Those who are more Catholic are called Anglo-Catholics. And they're, you know, they're sort of the most Catholic side of the Protestant faith. Um, you can go in Episcopal churches in the United States and you would swear you're in a Catholic church. There are the Stations of the Cross, full vestments, censers, secondary altars, reserve sacrament, the whole thing. You can go in other Episcopal churches in the United States. There will be none of that. It will be a simple chapel and there will be somebody playing guitar, singing sort of folk song kind of music for worship. And all of them are part of the Ang Anglican Communion because that middle way gets interpreted in different ways in different churches. All right, now, <coughs> uh, we then get into the question of, uh, you know, the relationship with the Pope. The Pope obviously is not happy about this. The Pope, in fact, e issues an edict that says that all Catholics are freed from the requirement to be obedient to Elizabeth, which does not sit well with the people who, Elizabeth and the others who are trying to maintain the authority of the, the Catholic, of the Protestant Church, of the actually of the throne. During this time, because the Catholic churches have been pretty much shut down, and not violently, it's been fairly calm, but clearly the movement is toward Protestantism, various Catholic seminary graduates, priests, are sneaking back into England in order to offer secret communion, since Catholic communion is not being openly offered in England at this time. Um, well, at the same time, there were various plots afoot to try to dethrone or even kill Elizabeth in order to reestablish Catholicism. The reason being, and we'll talk about this uh, when we come back, there was a Scottish queen, um, Mary Stuart, who was a possible claimant to the throne. In fact, if, um, if Elizabeth were to die, the most likely candidate for the throne would be Mary Stuart, who was the Queen of Scotland, and it had been the Queen of France. Very complicated. Uh, but Mary Stuart was Catholic, very Catholic. She'd been raised in Catholic France. So there were plots afoot to try to get rid of Elizabeth and put Mary Stuart on the throne of England, in addition to the throne of Scotland, in addition to the throne of France. But in the midst of these various people doing secret communions, and in the midst of these secret plots to try to get rid of Elizabeth, it was very hard to tell which of these is just offering communion and which of these is a plot to kill the queen. And so they, had, they made efforts to try to deal with these various plots. Um, and there were people that were executed for treason more than for heresy. See, Mary Tudor did it for heresy. Elizabeth really was defending the throne because the Catholics were the ones that were plotting to try to kill her. Um, and that ended up, you know, she ended up doing things she didn't really want to do either. Later on, the whole Protestant movement turned into Puritanism um, in England. But... Elizabeth ruled for 50 years, and in ruling for 50 years, she really did bring the Church of England to a place where even Catholics were accepted and accepting, and Catholic services began to be held again. Early on, she was pretty clear this has to be Protestant, even though Catholics were not prosecuted, they were not allowed to practice their faith as openly. Okay? We're going to take a break, and then we're going to come back and talk about the Reformation in Scotland, which links or overlaps with the Reformation we've just been talking about. Right? All right. I want to now talk about, and uh, actually, I didn't do these on purpose. This is, if you go online, 
there are various notes like this which will sort of follow you through what I talked about. But that, I thought that'd just be a distraction. Now, I confess to you, I don't have PowerPoint on some of this other stuff. You need to sit here in front of the camera. Fine. Okay. Um, Carolyn's going. Down in front. Is what I'm right. Down in front. Okay. Let's talk about the Reformation in Scotland, which ran parallel to, but quite different from the Reformation in England before they then kind of overlapped. Um, Scotland had been a kingdom. Ob obviously, you know the geography <laughs> that Scotland is geographically adjacent to England in the north. There was always a history of conflict between. The, the Picts and other people from Scotland, in fact, it got so bad that the Roman Empire, when they controlled Britain, decided they just couldn't do anything with the Scots. Um, and so they built a wall, Hadrian's Wall, and said, just keep them on the other side of the wall. I mean, we can't seem to defeat them, just keep them out. So there's always been a conflict there. Well, during much of this time, the 13th, 14th centuries leading up to, 15th century leading up toward the Reformation, um, Scotland and England were separate nations. Scotland traditionally, as I said earlier, had tended to support France against England because England was always trying to take over Scotland and they didn't appreciate it, okay? Um, and so, whereas England would be with, would side with Spain against France, Scotland would side with France against Spain or vice versa. You see what I mean? Um, and so, by the time we get to the 16th century, the 1500s, there really have developed two parties in England. Part of, or in Scotland, I'm sorry, part of Scotland still feels as though they can't trust the English, they don't want to be connected to the English, and they're still going to support France. But part of the Scottish nobility had started saying, look, we no longer have anything to fear, really, from England, because England had not been successful in doing anything to them in a long time, not since William Wallace kind of days. And so, therefore, it's to our advantage to develop a relationship with England. And so you had these two parties in Scotland. Again, the, issue, the foundational issues are not so much religious conviction as political aspiration. They had political ideas. Should they be connected with England, or should they maintain more of a relationship with France? Now, uh, especially as England is, is playing ping pong back and forth between Catholic and Protestant, you know, after Henry declares it, yeah, it's Catholic, and then Henry makes it Protestant, and then Protestantism changes pretty radically under Edward VI, and then it becomes Catholic under Mary, and then it becomes Protestant under Elizabeth. The Scottish are sort of, you know, sort of what? You know, the religious issues are not that great. Now, in 1502, James the the Fourth, who is the King of Scotland, is um, then offered the hand of um, Mary Tudor, who is the daughter of Henry the Seventh. Of England. This is Henry VIII's father, Henry VII. One of his daughters was called Margaret Tudor. Remember, Mary Tudor is Henry VIII's daughter. But Margaret Tudor was Henry VII's daughter. They married her to James IV of Scotland, which connects the two lines of royalty the Scottish royalty and the English royalty, which would create all kinds of problems later, you know, Monty Prince Charlie issues and all kinds of stuff. But, um, they, uh, when Henry VIII becomes the king of England, there is a hope that there's going to be an opportunity for the two kingdoms to work together. At least part of the people want that. The ones that want Scotland and England to be closer are hoping that's going to happen. In fact, James V, the son of James IV of Scotland and of Margaret Tudor, they talk about James V marrying Henry's... Um, uh, I'm sorry, marrying the, uh, Mary, the daughter, Mary Tudor. Okay, sorry about that. I got my Marys confused for a second. So, Margaret Tudor, the daughter of Henry VII, married to James IV of Scotland. They have a son, James V, and they talk to Henry VIII about having him marry Mary Tudor, who is the daughter of Henry VIII, in order to continue locking this in together. Because if that had happened, then there would have been a very clear link by the present king, Henry VIII's daughter, married to the, the son, the heir, of James V. But they don't do that. <laughs> okay? That's because there are two parties here. One of them doesn't want them to grow, Scotland to grow closer to England. And so they send uh, Henry V to get a wife from France. James V. James V marries 
Oh, this gets confusing even for me. James V marries Mary of Guise, who is a French princess. So, you see, this is the side that wanted Scotland and England to be closer. They're trying to get married more into the English royalty. The side that wants Scotland to not join with England, but join with France, they succeed and get their king married to Mary of Guise, who is a very Catholic princess from France. So there is a strong bond that's built there. Now, during this whole time, Protestantism had been leaking into Scotland, even though Scotland up to this point had been, like everybody else prior to this, has been Catholic. Um, there, there's a lot of influence from the doctrines of the Lollards, who had been the followers of John Wycliffe in England. They get some of the writings of John Huss from Bohemia come in. But there's a pretty strong effort for them to <coughs> try to suppress that. You even get Scots who had gone to the continent and studied in northern Germany. Uh, and so they bring Luther's ideas back. And early on, the Scottish Parliament is trying very hard to suppress that writing. And they, they burn their writings. They try to, um, to stop the people who are spreading Protestant teaching. And in 1528, they actually begin to have martyrs. The first martyr of a Protestant itinerant preacher occurs in 1528. And more, more and more are executed. Because Scotland, like most other countries at this point, they have not, this is 1528, this is 11 years after Luther nails the theses to the door, they're still Catholic. You know, they still are trying to stay uh, Catholic and keeping the new doctrines out, staying with the old doctrines. For all of that, a lot of the nobles in Scotland, because Scotland had a lot of nobles, you guys saw Braveheart, right? You know, they're the nobles, you know, William the Bruce and, you know, all that, those folks. There's, there are noble houses in Scotland. They are tending toward Protestantism for one reason, because the kings of Scotland are Catholic. And they think, you know, this will give us some power against them. You also get a lot of students. Those students are always rebellious. They like the ideas of Protestantism, and they're against the Catholic Church. So you get... Both ends of it. The students on the low end, the nobility on the high end, are beginning to accept Protestantism, even though officially Scotland is against it. Now, James V, the king of Scotland, dies in 1542. His only heir at that point is Mary Stuart, his very young daughter. In fact, she's an infant. Well, again, there's a power struggle there. There's a question as to um, what are we going to do with this young daughter? Henry VIII, king of England, comes up and says, look, let's let your infant daughter, the things they did, let's marry your infant daughter, Mary Stuart, to my son and heir, Edward VI, and there, that way we'll lock our two kingdoms together. Now, the, the Protestants in Scotland, the Scottish nobles, thought that was a great idea, because by this time, they had already established Protestantism in England, and they thought, great, we'll lock Protestantism in. But the idea of having Mary Stuart marry into the Protestant royalty of England, there are a group that oppose that because they don't, still don't like England in Scotland. A lot of them don't. So instead, they send Mary to France. Remember earlier, they had brought Mary's mother, Mary of Guise, to Scotland. She was a French Catholic. Well, now they send Mary Stuart, her infant daughter, back to France in order to be raised there after her father, James V, dies. So she's in France. She's being educated. Um, and during that time, we have an event where a group of Protestants get tired of waiting in Scotland. And they decide they're going to start taking some military action to establish Protestantism. And they go in, they conquer the castle in St. Andrews. Do you guys know St. Andrews? Anybody play golf? Well, of course. No. St. Andrews is considered the, the home. That's where golf comes from. So the St. Andrews course is still considered the great course. Well, St. Andrews is also a famous university town. Well, the Protestant military army, they get an army together, they go and they conquer the castle in, uh, in St. Andrews, and they kill the archbishop. They're controlling this castle. Well, because this is nobility, and they have an army and everything else, nobody else seems quite able to, to, to get, a, get rid of them. And so they continue to grow, control St. Andrews as a city and as a castle, as a Protestant stronghold in Scotland. About this time, a man named John Knox comes on the scene. Uh, John Knox was, we don't know anything really about his early life. We believe he was born sometime around 1515. So again, he was just a couple of years old when Luther started his shenanigans in, in uh, Germany. But we do know that John Knox studied theology. He had been ordained as a priest. 
and he had become a tutor to the sons of one of the Protestant nobles in Scotland. Not so Scottish, obviously. And when the Protestants take over the city of St. Andrews and the castle in St. Andrews, they tell John Knox, who's the tutor of two of the children of one of those Protestant nobles, okay, we want you to deliver my sons to the castle there, you know, because they're going to stay with us. John Knox plans on just delivering these two boys, and then he's going to take off to the continent in order to study Protestant theology more, because he's a Protestant too, but he hasn't been trained in it. He's going to go to Germany, he's going to visit, well, he goes to St. Andrews, and um, when he gets there, he, he basically can't get away. Not for, we don't know if it's because he got enamored of it or whatever, but they very quickly say, okay, you're now our preacher. John, you're trained in theology, you're a Protestant now, we want you to be our preacher. He becomes the theologian and the preacher and sort of the PR guy. He's the front man, he's the, the secretary of the press for the Protestants in St. Andrews. They continue there for a while until the French, the French have been preoccupied with you know, Francis I in, in France has been fighting with Charles V and all this back and forth. They haven't, they've had too many things on their hands to deal with Scotland's request to come and help us. The Scottish nobles, are, the, the Catholic nobles are saying, we can't put together an army strong enough to, to break into the castle at St. Andrews. And so they keep asking the French, would you send somebody to help us? Well, finally, the French get their, their situation stabilized enough that they send an army to Scotland. And that army is successful as they assault the castle. They get the Protestants to surrender because this is a pretty overwhelming force that's there. The Protestants surrender. Now, they had promised, if you surrender, we won't do anything to you. Well, they lied. One of the things they did is they took John Knox and several others, and they condemned them to service in the galleys. This wasn't just an ancient thing. I mean, the, the idea is they were literally tied to an oar and forced to row all day long. Now, um, John Knox spent, people often didn't survive that very long, okay, because they worked them to death. John Knox uh, was a galley slave for 19 months. And finally, um, Edward VI, the son of Henry VIII, who was a Protestant, appealed to France as, as a ruler in England and said, look, and to Scotland for that matter, let these guys go. You know, you promised that you weren't going to punish them. Now you, these, they spent 19 months as a galley slave. They may not live much longer. Let them go. And they finally released them. Well, when they released um, John Knox, he ended up, he made a couple of visits back to Scotland, but he ended up visiting Strasbourg and some other places and finally ended up in Geneva during the time when John Calvin, we talked about last week, John Calvin was the theological and the political leader of Geneva. And so for several years, John Knox learned Reformed theology from John Calvin. That theology, that Reformed theology, he would end up taking back to Scotland after being trained, where it became Presbyterianism. Okay? Because it was based upon a church structure that used elders. And the, the, the name for elder is presbyter. So Presbyterianism is an order, is, or Reformed theology, you could say, is the form of, of church which is based upon having ruled by elders. Well, John Knox learns that. In, in Geneva and takes it back to Scotland. In the meantime, several things have happened. Edward VI has died <clears throat> in England at age 15, and so Mary Tudor, becomes Mary I, she reinstitutes Catholicism in England, and a lot of these people, Protestants, leave England. And where do they go? They go to Geneva, they go to Strasbourg, they go to various other places where Protestantism is accepted on the continent. Um, and a number of them, not just John Knox, but a number of others, visit with Calvin. They go to Zurich with uh, Bullinger, uh, Zwingli's successor, um, etc. So there's all this going on. During this same time, Mary Stuart has been in France. Mary Stuart, the heiress, the future queen of Scotland, has been in France. She has been taught and, and whatnot by the House of Guise. Her mother, remember, was, was uh, Mary of Guise. So she's being trained by these Catholic French. In 1558, Mary marries the heir to the French throne. And so therefore she, a year later actually, he is, he is crowned Francis II, the King of France. So Mary, who's now 16 years old, becomes the Queen of France. She's also the heiress to the throne as Queen of Scotland. 
So she's in France, she's Catholic, she's the titular queen of Scotland, but that's not enough. By this time, Mary Tudor has died, and Elizabeth I becomes the queen of England, and she's a Protestant. Well, you'll remember that as a Catholic, Mary Stuart says, Elizabeth is not a rightful heir. She should not be on the throne of England because her, her uh, she's illegitimate. Her mother could not have legitimately married Henry VIII because they should not have annulled the marriage that Catherine of Aragon, the Catholic, uh, Catholic Catherine of Aragon, had with Henry VIII. Again, this is why Mary Tudor said, I'm for Catholicism. This is why Elizabeth said, I'm for Protestantism, because if you go the other way, you're not legitimate and you're not supposed to be on the throne. Well, Mary of Geese, um, Mary Stuart, I'm sorry, Mary Stuart is saying, I am the next in line because of my connections with the royal family of England, I should be the Queen of England. She's already the Queen of France. She is ready to become the Queen of Scotland, but she wants to be the Queen of England. And if Elizabeth is not the rightful Queen of England, then Mary Stuart is the next in line. Talk about ambition, okay? Now, um, during all of this time that Mary Stuart is in been in France. Her mother, Mary of Guise, has ruled as regent. Remember, her husband, James V of Scotland, has died. So Mary of Guise, the Catholic French princess, has been ruling in Scotland during this whole time. Well, they're, they're getting more and more support for Protestantism. In fact, during this time, uh, in, the, in the 1550s, a, a very clear division is set up between the nobility and others that support Mary uh, of Guise and the Catholic authority, and Protestant nobility. The Protestant nobility declare that they are uh, their goal is to serve the very blessed Word of God and His congregation. So they became known as the Lords of the Congregation, Protestants, against the Catholic, you know, Queen Regent. So back and forth. Each side is calling the other heretics. Each is trying to gain an upper hand, um, trying to get back to, for instance, the Protestants when they controlled St. Andrews and had sort of a foothold in there. In 1558, the Lords of the Congregation actually establish a church. And they declare it to be, by, their, by no authority other than their own, that it's the National Church of Scotland and it's Protestant. Well, the Catholic you know, regent, Queen Regent does not approve of that, does not like it. And it's at that point, however, that John Knox comes back from Geneva with the ideas of Reformed theology, and he, he creates the theology for this new National Church of Scotland. Okay? During this time, unfortunately, John Knox had gotten, gotten a little carried away with himself, and he wrote a book, or a, a treatise, that was called The First Blast of the Trumpet Against the Monstrous Regiment of Women. <laughs> he writes this intending it to be against Mary of Guise, who is the regent of Scotland, against Mary Tudor, who is the Catholic Queen of England by this point, and against Catherine of Medici, who is the queen mother in France, who really is pulling all of the, you know, all of the strings in France, um, because all of them are Catholic. And so he writes this book. It's very poorly timed because in it he sort of suggests that um, part of their problem is their women, and women shouldn't be rulers. Well, no sooner does this thing come out and get distributed than Mary Tudor dies and Elizabeth I becomes the Queen of England, a Protestant queen. Oops. And John Knox goes, oops. <laughs> he apologizes to Elizabeth, but she's not ready to take his apology because the stuff that he says in there, he argues that a woman should not be a ruler. And so no matter how many times John Knox tries to apologize, and say, it's only because they were Catholic, Elizabeth, I really like you. <laughs> Elizabeth doesn't accept his apology. And so there's a real strain there. And that's one of the things that keeps the Protestants of Scotland and the Protestants of England from working together. Is because they, the, you know, John Knox, who is the preacher and the theologian for the Church of Scotland, which is Protestant, has royally, literally, offended the Protestant Queen of England. All of this stuff happens. I'm sure if he could have taken it back and said, oh, let me edit this a little bit. But it didn't happen. So, during this whole time, it's not going very well for the Protestants in Scotland. In fact, the lords of the congregation, um, the French send another army over, and they crush the lords of the congregation. And so, 
The Protestants in Scotland are appealing to the Protestants in England, but Elizabeth is reluctant because of what John Knox wrote about women in, in power. So this goes on for a number of years, and finally in 1560, Elizabeth decides that she needs to help the Protestants in Scotland, and she sends an army to Scotland um, to join with the Scottish Protestants, and it looks like there's going to be a long, drawn-out war. And then Mary of Geese, the, the Queen Regent of Scotland, who's the strong Catholic, she dies. And when she dies, the French decide, okay, you know, we only came over here because she was one of us. She, Mary of Geese was French, and she had become the Queen Regent. When she, with her death, the French didn't have a whole lot of passion for pursuing this, and so the French and the, and the English, right before they get ready to go break gangbusters at each other, they decide, no, we don't need to do this, and they sue for peace, and they both go home. Now, during this time, you've got the lords of the congregation now are sort of surviving now. They're doing okay. Well, then we have a conflict that arises between John Knox, the Protestant theologian and preacher, and the lords of the congregation, which mean the Protestant nobility. It turns out that as the lords of the congregation now are beginning to gain some, some authority and beginning to get Protestant priests, etc., they're out for the money. They want to take over Catholic church land and use it for their own. John Knox says, no way, guys. That's not what we're about. That's not what the Reformation is about. John Knox says any money that comes in from the riches of lands that we got from the Catholic church, because they got turned over to the Protestant church, that that money needs to be spent to establish universal education for people, to lighten the load of the poor, and to support the church, not to go in your coffers. And so we get a conflict in all of that. Well, these Protestant nobles decide John Knox is not helping us here. And so they join with Catholic nobles, and they invite Mary Stuart, who is heir to the throne, back from France. Mary Stuart, who she had been Queen of France, but a short time before this, her husband had died. Francis II had died. So she was no longer queen. Somebody else was on the throne, so she lost that. She still kept saying she, she thought she should be Queen of England, but now they invite her to come back to Scotland to be the Queen of Scotland. So she goes back to Scotland, she takes over the throne, uh, but the whole time she keeps insisting that she ought to be the Queen of England too. And when she comes back, she starts practicing Catholic Mass, which that begins to sort of rub it in the face of the Protestants who have gained an upper hand somewhat. In, in, in Scotland. Now she does okay for a while because she had a, an illegitimate half-brother named James Stuart, the Earl of Moray. And everybody knew they were related. I mean, people back then, they would announce these things. But he was a Protestant. And because he was half-brother, Mary listened to him. And so she, taking his counsel, she got along okay for a while. All right, And she was, she was listening to the Protestant, her Protestant half-brother, during this time, John Knox is being very open and saying it's only a matter of time until I and we, the Protestants, and Mary Stuart, the Queen of Scotland, are going to go at it. It's going to become hammer and tongs here before very long. This is not going to last, even though she's keeping her head down. Well, Mary continued to have Mass celebrated in her private chapel, and the Protestants didn't like that. They considered that idolatry. Okay? They were very adamant about this. <coughs> now, um, during this time, they're, they're inventing various Protestant kind of services and things like that. The Protestant churches continue to grow. But Mary Stuart's ambition finally was her downfall. First, um, she ended up marrying her cousin, Henry Stuart, who was Lord Darnley. She did that because she thought that would strengthen her case. It was a bad move. Darnley was Catholic. It was a bad move, and her half-brother James, the Earl of Moray, said, it's a bad move, you shouldn't do it, why are you doing this? She gets so frustrated with him, she chases him off, and he goes to England, sort of in semi-exile. Well, she's married for a little while to this guy, uh, Lord Darnley, and then she decides she really doesn't like him. And in fact, she shouldn't have married him. She strikes up a friendship with a man named James Hepburn, Lord Bar uh, Bothwell, who is a very competent military leader. And her half-brother, James Stuart, Earl of Moray, comes back with an army. Well, Bothwell defeats Moray, drives him off. Then Mary sort of 
you know, subtly suggests to Bothwell, this military leader and manly man who's now, you know, on her side, you know, Lord Darnley is kind of a pain. It'd be great if he wasn't around anymore. And so he's assassinated. <laughs> and everybody, and well, and a few months later, she marries Bothwell. So pretty much everybody knows that Mary's responsible for this, that Bothwell killed Mary's husband, Darnley, so that he and Mary could get married. It does not go well for her after this. Um, she tries to take action against her, her half-brother, Jaden, the Protestant Earl of Mori, comes back. And she calls her army up and says, okay, go get her. And they go, not so much. Her army will not obey her. They've decided she can't be trusted. She, she had her husband killed so she could marry the other guy who killed him. So Mary is in a, a hard way. The Scottish lords won't support her. The military won't support her. She ends up having no choice but to flee to the only place that she's still got relatives that will accept her, which is London, England. And her cousin, Elizabeth, who she has been saying for years was an illegitimate child, had no right to the throne, should not be the Queen of England, that she, Mary Stuart, should be the Queen of England. Mary Stuart, everybody's against her now, and so she flees to England. Elizabeth, classy lady that she is, as I said, she may be the greatest regent, the greatest ruler that anybody's ever had, she accepts Mary with great courtesy. Even though Mary has been saying for years that somebody needs to kill that awful person Elizabeth so I can be queen. Mary Stuart is brought down. Elizabeth receives her. She insists everybody give her every grace as queen. She's allowed to have her 30 of her own servants to take care of her. She's given a very luscious castle to live in. Anything she wants, the only restriction is she has to stay in the castle. Okay? Um, because it's clear that if Mary Stuart got an opportunity, she would try to dethrone Elizabeth. Well, Elizabeth is trying to be patient, but she keeps hearing these rumors that Mary Stuart is either inspiring Catholic plots to get rid of her, or she's at least going along with them. And she puts it off and puts it off and puts it off. And, and by the way, Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, had been suggesting to Mary Stuart for a long time, you know, Catholics that they were, and related as they were through various other things, you really should, you know, do something to have Elizabeth killed. And that was widely known. Okay. Well, they come back. <coughs> Mary Stuart is in London. She's being well treated, but these rumors keep coming up. Various plots keep getting uncovered. And finally, against her, her desire, she doesn't want to, Elizabeth decides she doesn't have any choice. When finally they, they get a, a conspiracy that's uncovered, that there's no question by the evidence that Mary, at least, Mary Stuart at least was involved in it if she didn't inspire it. So Elizabeth finally decides a very difficult decision of saying that she needs to have Mary executed for treason, for trying to you know, have her killed and undermine her, her throne. So there's the wonderful story that's done of Mary Stuart when she comes out to be beheaded. She comes out in a, in a cloak, and when she casts off the cloak to be beheaded, she's wearing this bright red dress. And her dog, her little dog, lap dog, is underneath the skirts of her dress. And so even though she's being beheaded, you got to give Mary Stewart credit, she went out with class. Okay? <laughs> she really did go out like a queen, but she did end up being executed. And, and I don't think any historians believe that she was innocent. She really was doing everything she could, and, and because of everything she'd been saying for years. So at that point, with Mary uh, Stuart out of Scotland, with the uh, Scottish nobles in decline, and more of the Protestant nobles, and the students, and John Knox, and whatnot on the ascension, in Scotland it became officially a Calvinist Presbyterian, elder, elder based church, and became the seedbed for Presbyterianism around the world. It was from Scotland that the Presbyterian Church in the United States and in Canada, for instance, started. Um, and in Canada, that's led to the United Church, and you know, one of the churches that formed the United Church was Presbyterian. In the U.S., the Presbyterian Church USA, the Presbyterian Church America, Reformed Presbyterian Church, and on and on and on. So from Calvin, we talked about that before, probably the two most significant ways that Calvin uh, influenced the church was through John Knox and Presbyterianism in Scotland, which spread around the world, 
and then through Dutch students, as in the same way that John Knox studied with Calvin and then went to Scotland, we had Dutch scholars study with Calvin and go back to the Netherlands, from which we got the Dutch Reformed Church, and then in the U.S. the Christian Reformed Church, etc. And all of those Reformed Churches all linked themselves back to, to uh, Geneva and Calvin. So any questions about Scotland, or England for that matter, and what was happening there? Lots of struggle. But that's how Protestantism became the faith in one form or another in both. Now, England, you've got the Church of England, which is based upon Henry's ideas, and, and uh, then Edward VI and uh, Elizabeth I. In the north, you've got Presbyterianism in the National Church of Scotland, which is Protestant, but is based upon Calvin's theology, not the stuff that was developed by Thomas Cranmer and, and, and others. Okay? All right, I want to spend a few minutes talking about the further developments in Lutheranism. We've got about 18 minutes here. You will remember previously on church history that Luther uh, in Germany, Germany was not a united kingdom. There were various principalities and various duchies or dukedoms where, and, and they were going back and forth. Various of them would declare that they thought Luther was right. And the only person to try to disagree with him, there was no king of Germany, there was no single ruler of Germany, the only person who could say anything was the Holy Roman Emperor. And he only had a very loose control. His control was based upon whether his military was sufficient. Well, the problem with that is as more and more people started believing Luther was right and siding with him, you know, people like Philip of Hesse, uh, uh, Frederick the Wise, these are these, they had their own uh, dukedoms. Okay? I don't think that's a real word, word. I think it's called a duchy, but you know, they were dukes and princes. <clears throat> As more of them started believing that Luther was right, Charles V had a problem because he had Turks invading Eastern Europe. And at various times, he had problems with the Pope, that he'd have to march down and straighten out some problem the Pope had. And so Charles, every time he thought, okay, I'm ready now, I'm going to take some action against these Protestants, because he was very Catholic. He had been Charles I of Spain. He became Charles V of uh, the Holy Roman Emperor. Every time he thought he would deal with this, some other demand prevented him from it. And so you will remember from our previous classes, he finally had agreed to a peace agreement called the Peace of Nuremberg, in which the various princes or dukes that controlled their areas, they could decide what their people were going to be in terms of Catholic or Protestant. Now, interestingly enough, that only involved people who agreed with the, uh, the Confession of Augsburg, which means it only meant Lutherans. If you're a Calvinist or you're an Anabaptist, eh, you're not part of the deal. So only Lutherans were included. But the Peace of Nuremberg, which was in 1532, said that any of the provinces or princedoms or duchies of Germany, if the ruler decided they were Protestant, they could be Protestant. If they're Catholic, they could be Catholic. But the one exception, or the one, the one uh, condition was, the Protestants had to stay where they were. They couldn't keep spreading. Well, that didn't work. Because even though the royalty might not be spreading, the individuals were carrying the message. And so what happened is, in Germany, things got very complicated. You ended up with, um, with people, again, for political reasons, who wanted to oppose Charles V. Well, if you wanted, Charles V was the head of the Habsburg um, regime. The Habsburgs, the House of Habsburg was based in Austria. He had inherited that when he became the uh, head of the Holy Roman Empire. And so the House of Habsburg had always been a powerhouse that everybody was afraid of. And so a lot of these political guys who may have been Catholics originally were thinking, okay, I'm scared that Charles is going to get so much power, we need to take him down a peg. We need to do something to oppose him. Well, the most obvious thing is I need to side with the Protestant princes who were sticking it to Charles, and together we might be able to do something. There ended up being what was called the, you know, the... Um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the Schmalkalden, the uh, colloquy of Schmalkalden, which was the Protestant princes and dukes of Germany that got together. It included people like Philip of Hesse, as I mentioned, the League, that's the word I was looking for, the League of Schmalkalden. And so they, they, at a certain point, the only thing that Charles could do was encourage the Catholics to get together in a similar kind of League. And they actually did, they created the League, the League of Nuremberg, that to oppose the Protestants, and so you had people siding. 
And they were making these decisions not based upon religious convictions, usually, but usually it was based upon political aspirations. Who, who do I want to side with here based upon who I want to take down a peg or who I, I want to lift up some? Now, during this whole time, various things were happening. Various previously Catholic rulers started deciding for Protestantism, even though it had been said that they couldn't do that under the Peace of Nuremberg. Certain ones started saying, oh, no, we're on that side, we're on this side. And the Protestants were growing and growing. More of these various princedoms were becoming uh, Protestant. The Catholics were really feeling it. And then, almost at one time, three things happened that really kind of put the kibosh on the Protestants for a while in Germany. The first thing was the bigamy of Philip of Hesse. Uh, Hesse. Philip of Hesse uh, the, was one of the most significant leaders. He was the one, if you remember from our last class, tried to get Luther and Zwingli and Busser and these various other Protestant guys together to convince them that you're all really pulling on the same rope, why don't you get together? Well, Luther and Zwingli couldn't agree on the nature of the communion. But Philip, Philip of Hesse, was very committed to the Protestant movement and did everything he could to support it. Unfortunately, he ended up with a problem. He was married. His wife was not responsive to her marital duties, as he would have said. <laughs> and he was a man of great passion. He, as, a, as a Christian, he didn't want to just commit adultery. And so he's trying to figure out what to do about this. You know, he's driven by his urges. He doesn't know what to do with those urges because his wife won't respond. And so he goes to several of the Protestant theologians and leaders. Luther, Melanchthon, Busser especially, Busser and Strasbourg, and says, what can I do about this? Well, they all, very bad judgment gets exercised here. And this is one of the things that Luther is, is one, of the, one of the dark marks on Luther's reputation. These the Protestant theologians go to the scripture and they go, you know, the Bible never actually says that polygamy is wrong. What? <laughs> so they counsel Philip of Hesse, this hero. He really is the political leader of the Protestant movement in Germany. They suggest he take a second wife and just keep quiet. Well, keeping it quiet was important because it may not have been against God's law, according to these guys, but it was against civil law. So he takes a second wife. And then everybody finds out. <laughs> Which they always do, yeah. guys. <laughs> um, and so, this, so many of the members of the League of Schmalt Kalkin uh, are so offended by him committing bigamy that they start saying, we're not going to support this anymore. We're not going to support it. And so, the political leadership with Philip of Hesse's bigamy is greatly damaged amongst the Protestants. The second thing that happens is there's a very significant Duke of Saxony, Duke Maurice of Saxony, who has declared himself a Protestant. He is seen as a very significant leader. A lot of people follow his lead. He decides he is not going to join the lead of Schmalkalden, which means the other Protestant guys that have all joined together. They all joined together because they said, if, if we get attacked, we're going to have to defend ourselves. Well, Duke Maurice of Saxony says, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go my own way. I'm going to follow my own policy. Partly because Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, had convinced Maurice, Duke of Saxony, that he wasn't really against Protestantism. Shh. He was only against the rebellion of the Protestant Lutheran princes. And so he, could, Charles V convinced Duke Maurice, you can be Protestant, just be loyal to me. And you're not being loyal to me if you join with those other guys who have political things behind their Protestantism. So Maurice decides that he's not going to join them, and that's a blow against the Protestant movement. Because a major leader has said, I can be Protestant without being part of you guys. And then the third major blow against Protestantism at that point is Luther dies. Luther, in 1546, passes away. At this point, Luther in Germany was the only figure, the single figure, who had any potential for drawing together all the Protestants. He's the only one that they all looked at. And so that was a very significant problem. As if that wasn't bad enough, after all three of those things happened, the bigamy of Philip of Hesse, the rejection of the uh, League by the Duke of, Duke of Saxony, and then Luther's death, Charles ends up resolving some of his differences in the eastern part of the empire, etc., decides that now's the time he takes his army and invades Germany in order to force these Protestant princes and dukes to come under his authority. He captures Philip of Hesse 
and John Frederick. John Frederick is the, was the son of Frederick the Wise, the guy who first had defended Luther, you know, and protected him while he was writing the New Testament or the Bible and all that. So the emperor conquers Germany, and these princes are sort of at his control. Well, he's smart enough at this point to know it's gone too far for him to force them to be Catholic again. So he forces them to, instead to simply agree to what's called the Augsburg Interim, which says, everybody cool it, stop doing what you're doing, nobody, Catholic or Protestant, move forward on this, and, and there are some restrictions in there, which um, a number of Protestant theologians, including Philip Melanchthon, agree to the interim of uh, Augsburg. They actually do their own version of it, which Charles accepts, called the, the, the uh, Leipzig Interim, but they agree to what Charles is saying. Other Protestants get really mad at him and say to Melanchthon, for instance, Melanchthon was the heir. He was the, the guy who really uh, led the Lutheran movement after Luther. They say to Melanchthon, chicken, you know, what's wrong with you? And they call him a coward. And they say, you've got to stand up to this guy. Melanchthon says, I did not agree to anything that is a central doctrine, you know, but the essential doctrines. I only agreed to his direction on what's called the adiaphora. There's a theological word that, that you can use and impress all your friends. Adiaphora means the peripheral stuff. The stuff that's there, but it's not critically important. Things, we would say things like, okay, do you dunk or sprinkle when you baptize? That's not an issue of salvation for most of us, it is for a few. But, uh, but it is, you know, it's a principle. And so, Melanchthon said, we gave in to Charles's demands only on the peripheral stuff, the adiaphora, but not nothing essential. But it ended up creating a real problem there. Then various of the Protestant princes started protesting significantly against Charles because apparently he, had, he was mistreating, or some of his people were mistreating, um, uh, John Frederick, the son of Frederick the Wise, and Philip of Hesse. They were being held captive and they were not being treated well. And so some of them decide they're going to fight back and they approach, you know, who's Charles V's big enemy? The king of France. At this point, it's not Francis anymore. It's Henry II. The Protestants go to Henry II, and even though Henry II, you know, wouldn't necessarily be theologically on their side, he doesn't like Charles V. So they get together. Henry II invades part of Charles's territory. So Charles has got to pay attention to that. In fact, the assault is so successful when Charles tries to respond, he almost gets captured. He has to flee. He has no power. He, he sends some of his troops to try to retake a couple of the cities that the Protestants have taken, and they're not successful. Um, it, it, it ends up being really bad. His son, uh, who is Ferdinand, Ferdinand takes over with his father's permission, sort of takes over, but Ferdinand takes an approach of trying to reconcile. He releases Philip of Hesse and John Frederick, uh, of, John Frederick of Saxony. He grants freedom of religion throughout the empire. In fact, some Catholics said that Ferdinand was so generous, they thought he might have secretly become a Protestant, <laughs> even though his father was the champion of Catholic faith. So at that point, they all agree, a principle called cuius regio eius regi, a religio, which means whatever the ruler says is the religion of the people. Okay. The ruler gets to decide. At this point, Charles V is so worn out, he is tired of all this fighting, tired of not being able to get done what he wants to get done. He resigns. He <laughs> gives power to his son to rule various areas. And he, in 1555, he, he abdicates uh, to his brother, uh, part of it, to his son, part of it. And he goes to a monastery in Spain, he spends the rest of his life in the monastery. Now, don't think of him in a tiny cell with a, you know, with a coarse, he had all the palm that he had as a ruler and emperor but he had it in the monastery, <laughs> and he didn't have any, any <clears throat> problems anymore. He was still advising his son and his brother, but he was not in charge of that, okay? Now, I'm going to spend five minutes and tell you about, about the, and, and as a result of that, Protestantism, without Charles V to try to suppress them, Protestantism continued to grow, it continued to expand. The successor to the Charles V, uh, eventually, after Ferdinand, was Maximilian II, um, and he was in favor of Protestantism, and so it continued to grow. <laughs> You end up with some Catholic areas and some Protestant areas. If you go to Germany today, there will be parts of Bavaria, for instance, that are very Catholic. Well, that's because what's now the nation of Germany, for instance, used to be a lot of different duchies and princedoms, and at one point they all decided for themselves, or the, the, the authorities, the rulers decided, and they became whatever that person decided. And you still see that 
not with rigid lines anymore, but there still are areas in the country that are more Catholic than others. Okay? Um, very quickly, in Scandinavia. Scandinavia almost went the opposite way of England in terms of um, was it the ruler who decided or was it the people? In theory, in Scandinavia at this time, there was one king, a united kingdom over Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. But in fact, the king who lived in Denmark really only controlled Denmark. He didn't have, he, he had some influence in Norway and in Sweden. They, you know, he, the technicality of him being king had nothing to do with it. They didn't listen to him. There was a, a, a several powerful families who sort of served as regents in uh, Sweden at that time. Now, once the Protestant Reformation comes along, um, we end up with the king in Denmark at that point is named Christian II, and he decides that he is going to take this Protestant Reformation thing and claim it as his authority to really control all of Scandinavia, not counting Finland, okay, but uh, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. So he marries Charles V's sister Isabella, Spanish Isabella. And so he's got Charles V on his side, the Holy Roman Emperor, who's still alive. I had to step back in time, but he's still alive ruling at this point. He gets his support and he decides to march north. He locks himself in in Norway and then he marches into Sweden and he conquers Sweden with the support of the Holy Roman Emperor. Now when he conquers Sweden and the capital of Stockholm, he tells them there's, there's not going to be any retribution, you're all safe. Well, a week later, the massacre of Stockholm happens. And there is a huge, a great number of leading aristocrats and ecclesiastics from Sweden are murdered. And he said, oh, well, I was trying to save the Swedes from their own, you know, uh, um, illegal or inappropriate leadership. But at that point, nobody wants to listen to this guy anymore. They don't trust him. And so he begins to lose authority. Not only is there an uprising in Sweden to fight back, but he has problems in Norway, he has problems in Denmark. Eventually, he is forced to flee because even other Protestants don't want to have anything to do with him because of the massacre of Stockholm. And he's claimed Protestantism. So he flees the country. He's gone for a while on the continent. He comes back. He lands in Norway and declares that he is now the champion of Catholicism. When his whole excuse for having invaded Sweden and Norway earlier, even though technically he was the, the ruler, he didn't have real power, had been because of the Protestant Reformation, and he claimed to be Protestant. Now he's a Catholic. His uncle and his eventual successor, Frederick I, who, who is the um, related to Charles V, he says, no, nah, no, no, no. And he comes against him, he defeats him, he imprisons him for the rest of his life, which is 27 years that Christian II spent in prison. Okay? Now, Frederick I, the guy who defeated him, was a Protestant. Many of the people of the nobility had come to the point where they agreed with this. If you know anything about Scandinavia today, you know it is very Protestant. It is very Lutheran. Okay? But at, this is the point at which the, the new king, uh, Ferdinand I, decides he's not going to attack Catholicism, and he's not going to specifically favor Protestantism. He's going to give people the right to make their own choice, but he obviously prefers Protestantism. He tells, you know, he's in Denmark, he's ruling from Denmark now. Um, he tells Norway, you can elect your own king. You have complete freedom. And the Norwegians go, well, that's cool. We'd like for you to be our king. <laughs> and so Ferdinand I becomes the king of Denmark, and by election, the king of Norway. Later on, um, he, as Protestantism continues to grow, he has a lot of influence as a Protestant Lutheran in Sweden as well, but they still say, stay pretty independent. Um, in fact, in Sweden, a unique thing was after the massacre of Stockholm, there's a young man named Gustavus Eriksson who became, comes to be known as Gustavus Vasa. He escapes as a Protestant from uh, Sweden. He later on comes back secretly and begins to find out what the people are thinking and what the people are saying. He declares a rebellion against, at this point, Christian II is technically still in charge, proclaims a national rebellion, he takes up arms, he gets a group of followers, he wins victory after victory, one daring feat of arms after another. Nobody can seem to stop this guy, even though he started out with almost nothing. Eventually, he, after conquering and winning battles all over the country, he marches back into Stockholm in triumph in 1521, and they declare him king by acclamation. 
They just name him king. Say, you're the guy we want as our king. Um, he, and he's a smart guy. He doesn't have a whole lot of authority because the nobility and the prelates, that is, the, the heads of the church, still have a lot of power. But the king starts a very subtle, this, this King Gustav Vasa, starts a program where he starts dividing people. For instance, a bunch of bishops rebel. They've got an army behind them. He defeats them. He captures the bishop, tries them, and executes them. And he tells all of his followers, you were misled. You can go home. And they're all going, really? You're not going to kill us too? He's, he does things like that where he, he, the common people, he gives them every break he can. It's only the, the high-level people, the rich people, the, the bishops, and etc. that fight against him. And, he, and then he says, no, no, it's not your fault, people. You're okay. You're my people. And they love him. And they think he's great. Finally, he calls a, a colloquy of the clergy and the nobility and the lay people of the country to make decisions about their future. Well, the clergy and the nobility band together, and they start trying to thwart his program of reform in the country, political reform and religious reform for Protestantism. And so he says, well, okay, if you feel that way, I quit. And he goes home. And they're all panicking. It, for three days, they cannot decide anything. They're, there's complete chaos. And so they call him back, and they say, would you come be our king again? <laughs> and Vasa goes in and says, sure, I'll do that. And from that point on, he has authority to do whatever he thinks he needs to do. And he reforms the church, he reforms the National Assembly, he represents the voice of the people, and Protestant beliefs eventually become, you know, completely inculcated in Sweden as they already have in Norway and in Denmark. And so that's the growth of Protestantism there. Um, by the time he dies in 1560, Sweden is considered a completely Protestant Lutheran country. Okay, all those Swedes. Any questions or comments about that? I'm about three minutes old. So any of you from that tradition, you now know something about, how many people are Swedish? Okay, we've got a hero, Gustavus Vaza. Go learn about it. Okay, yeah, Margaret, okay. Um, all right, folks, thank you, blessings. We didn't get into the low countries in France, but we will deal with that at the start of next week's class, okay?